Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I thank you for joining us. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss The Beast of War, which came out in 1988 from director Kevin Reynolds. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, the story follows a Russian tank crew who have just attacked a village in Afghanistan within the second year of the invasion of Afghanistan. The tank is separated from their armoured column and end up being stuck inside a valley with only one entrance and one exit. They are being hunted by a group of Afghan villagers seeking revenge on the tank crew. But as we follow the story, we question who are the heroes and who are the villains? I'd never heard of this film really? at all. You know, I've seen quite a lot of war films, but mm. this one seems to have been lost in the desert. <laughs> you know, and you know, looking into the history of this film, there's very there's very little information I could find on the internet about the film's making of. Wow. Except for the fact that this was a Columbia Pictures production. Okay. But when the film was finished, the head of Columbia Pictures resigned and somebody else stepped in his position, yeah. looked at this film that the studio had made and just went, eh, mm, don't really like it, don't really feel like it's a, you know, a good climate to release this film into. Yeah, yeah. And so they changed the name and released it to just a, the bare bones amount of theatres, so no one got to see it. And so the film also has two names. It's also known as The Beast. Yeah. And that was what it was changed to upon release, whereas the full name is The Beast of War. And so when you have an obscure film, you know, that has two names, yeah. it just helps the film get buried even more. So when this came up as a request, it was just like, what? what is this? <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing this, um, well, not seeing this, but I saw the trailer when I was younger. It was at the start of a lot of VHSs that I was watching. And I remember, you know, mainly you had this fucking great big tank moving through the desert, you know, the wide open mountain ranges of, of Afghanistan. You know, I, I remember an actor being tied to a rock, you know, and there's lots of screaming and shouting and just the craziness of war. And like you said, at the time that this film had been released, the, the Afghanistan conflict was go heavily going on. I mean, it's still going on today and i was very surprised when I, I looked into the history of that conflict that it's been going on since 1978 yeah you know and and yeah the the russians ended up invading them and causing masses of load of devastation before they ended up pulling out and then there was all the upheaval from the afghanistanis and and then obviously it would go on to 2001 with the world trade center attacks and then hey we've got to go over there and we've got to take out the taliban and al-qaeda and growing up at that time, you know, the news only tell you so much. Yeah. You only find out so much information. So when I was growing up, it was like, oh, the Afghans are bad guys. You know, they're the terrorists. They're this and that. You don't get the idea from Rambo 3, though. You know, that you're, t you're told that they're the heroes fighting against the Russians. What surprised me massively when I actually sat down to watch this for the review was the stars in it. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, at first you've got George Zunda, Zunza, I think it is, uh, playing Commander Daskal. Uh, he, he's been in great films like The Deer Hunter, and I think I remember him majorly from Crimson Tide yes, as the master yeah. of the boat. You know, he's the commander of the tank, and he, he looks broken. Unhinged almost from the get-go, yeah. Yeah, and he's in control of a fucking giant beast of a tank. You've got Jason Patrick playing a Kovachenko. I haven't seen him in a long time. No, I obviously, you know, everybody remembers him from Lost Boys. And a lot of the time people remember him from Speed 2 Cruise Control. And that's where he gets hated. But I always liked him in Narc right. with um, Ray Liotta. And what surprised me was, you know, Jason Patrick gets a lot of hate for some of the acting that he has done. And yet, like you said... Nobody had ever brought up the beast. No, or well, of the, course not. Or the beast of war. And I thought his performance in this was absolutely brilliant. You've got Stephen Bauer playing uh, Khan Taj, one of the, uh, the Mujahideen, I think it is, the, yeah. the rebel villagers trying to chase down the tank. 
it's Manny from Scarface. You know, I looked on his list and it's like, yeah, he played this character in Breaking Bad as well. And I'm like, this guy is really still fucking going today yeah. in some great performances. You've got Stephen Baldwin playing Golikov. He was almost unrecognisable, you know, because he's so young and so <laughs> thin yes. in this film. Yeah, but he's still got that kind of crazy look that he would take on into, uh, like, the usual suspects. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, I mean, Biodome is an awesome film. I'll just go check that out there. You've got... Donald Patrick Harvey playing Kaminsky. Now, he's he's probably been in a lot, but I remember him majorly from Casualties of War right. with Michael J. Fox. And it's funny that this film came out a year before Casualties, and yet you see his character in this. It's kind of the basis of, of his Clark character yeah. in Casualties. And another great war movie there. You've got Eric Avari playing Samad. He's been in films like Stargate and, and The Mummy and a whole host of other movies. But he's he's such a intelligent actor. Yeah. You know, and, and with the racism that would come along in this film, it really does kind of hit you in some places. And and so I was already, you know, I was all ready to be like, right, this this is going to be a great film. I've got a whole line of stars here that I've grown up watching and I've never seen it. So let's see how it goes. And the opening with that village. Now, I've just got to check this out there before you, before you jump in. I think war is really fucking stupid. Um, I think I always have. I don't really uh, understand the whole point of conflict. You know, we've been doing it for, I say we, humans have been doing it for well over fucking 10 million years or whatever. <laughs> you know, and it's just... It just seems completely pointless at the end of the day. There is no victor. Well, no. <laughs> well, and it, sometimes, but... <laughs> well, the survivors are the victors, I suppose. Yeah. But this opening sequence, you've got this village in the middle of the mountains. People are waking up. Going they, about their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, herding their goats and playing with their children. You know, okay, they've got a couple of rifles. And then three fucking tanks turn up. And start laying waste to the whole village. Well, at first, they, you hear that, that whistling noise, don't you? The, yeah. The jet fighters flying off overhead, which you don't see. But then, of course, the explosions on the mountainside and then buildings exploding. And yeah, it's, it, it just shows you the horrors of war, especially when it's on a civilian populace or a village like this. Yeah. And we know, and, you know, throughout war, that there are. Casualties, innocent civilian casualties that are just bombarded, you know, whether it's misinformation or, or whatever. Or, or just general racism from the people from, who... From the invaders, yeah. But, but this is what I'm talking about. Three fucking tanks against a village, you know? And they literally lay waste to the place. You have that one guy who I think he's on a... He gets a... An RPG set, yeah, up. or a recoilless rifle. That's right, and yeah. He far he fires it and... They, he misses... And they capture him, beat him down, give him a good old fucking kick in. And then it's like, right, okay, lay him in front of the tra track of the tank. Yeah, you know, wh when they laid him there, I was like, this is, this is pretty harsh. But I don't know whether they'll actually go through with it. You know, you can tell that some of the, the Russians that are there are just like, this is a little bit wrong. You know, yeah. you shouldn't really be doing this. But their captain orders it to happen. You can see that the Afghan townspeople are, are you know, protesting about it happening. Yeah. But it's not enough, you know, then they martyr him underneath this tank. Well, yeah, well, he, he, he obviously gives himself to it because in a way, the way he's been raised, if he does this, he, he's fought to protect his, his In people. the holy war, he's died. Yeah, and he's, and he's martyring himself, so he will go off to paradise. We don't know if that will actually happen or not, but they ride over him with the tank. <laughs> that was... That was brutal. That was horrible, you know? The the film is very good at only giving you a snippet of it because you see his feet and sandals pressed up oh, against the track. Yeah. And obviously when the tank starts moving and the chains go over, you see his feet crush yeah. underneath it. And that's it. It cuts away a little bit. And you see him underneath holding the tank as it's coming over him. And he's kind of laughing and kind of screaming. Yeah. And, you know... That, within the first five minutes of the film, will stick with you 
way through, way past the film, way afterwards as well. It's just a horrific way to go. Well, you know? I mean, one of the other sequences I thought was quite harsh was when all the women started picking up rocks and yes. were trying to attack the tank. Yes. And yeah. they couldn't do any damage. No. And they, the, the, the tank crew just opened up that hatch and just dropped one of those gas grenades out the bottom. Yep. And everyone tries to run, but there's one still left. On the top, yeah. And she ends up dying. And I'm just like, what was, what was the point? You know, what, what, who gave the order that this was a good idea? Three tanks against the village. But the tanks roll off. And they're meeting up with a convoy somewhere else. Yeah, and, and you see them from the air that, you know, there's a, there's a junction in the road. And I think it's Kovachenko who's driving. And he says, do I go left or right, Commander? And the commander goes, go right. And Kovachenko's like, are you sure? Yes, yes, go right. And that's what leads them into this valley. This one route is the only way in or out. And so that's it. But then you, you cut, to, you cut to, to Taj, played by Stephen Bauer, who's, who's, who's come back to the village. I don't know, they, were, they might have been out herding sheep or, or, or you know, getting supplies. And he gets back and he realises... His dad's dead. He realises his brother's dead. He realises that half the fucking people in the village are all dead. And he's the Khan of it. Well, he is now. Yeah, now he, he his, is now, yeah. All, that all of the ones that were you know, in lineage for it are now dead. And he has his uncle with him. He's yeah. there, you know, like the wise one trying to tell him, sort of telling him how best to proceed. Um, but then, you know, I guess the rebels... Kind of turn up. Is that? I think his name's Mustafa or Musafa. Yeah, he's the cousin to Taj, isn't he? That's right. Sporting the sunglasses and all of his fucking spoils of war. You know, he, you know, he's been fighting this battle against these Russians for a while. You know, the we even see it in the tagline at the beginning, where the second year of the Russian invasion. Yeah. You know, so when you invade another person's country, they're gonna fight back. And Taj is like, no, no, no. And the uncle's just like, you know, you, you want revenge. You want, I think they call it Bali? Oh, yeah. Badao. Badao, yeah. Badao, you know, you want revenge. So we're going to go and get them. And they've got a, a, an RPG. Yeah. But it's malfunctioning. And they've only got a couple of rounds for it. So if they can get a good shot on this tank. They can take it out. But we cut back to the tank uh, moving through the valley, and I love some of those shots. Yeah, it's it's so beautifully shot. Yeah, you know, it's there's not that much color to it, but no. it, it it is, you know, for I guess you know almost ninety nine percent of this film's audience will never ever go to Afghanistan and see those deserts for themselves. Yeah, and so only through you know the art of film. Do we get to see it presented uh, this way? And it, it's striking. And... It, it, what got me was how isolated it was. You know, you've got this one tank in the middle of this huge valley, yeah. you know, and yeah, okay, it's a tank, but they could be surrounded on all sides and they would start taking damage. And it's, it's such a contrast, like you said, with other war movies. You know, when you look at things like Platoon, when they're all in the jungle, yeah. you know, someone, something like uh, Black Hawk Down, where they're in the city and there's so much going on. Yeah, in this, it's just the tank, the the five crew members inside, and every now and again we're getting the 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 villagers running and trying to catch up with them. See, it's at this point that I kind of I figured out what this film is at this point. Okay. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm kind of you know I kind of got excited at this point. You know, of course the film is presenting you know the the horrors of war. Yeah, yeah. But as a as a piece of film, I was like, I'm I'm excited now. This is. This is a chase movie. Yes. You know? Yes. It's a war road trip movie. Yeah. Where you are, you're sympathetic to a couple of the Russians in the tank who have had to do horrible things because they have been ordered to do it. Yes. And they're, and it's weighing heavily on their conscience. You know, they know that the morality of the situation is fucked up. Yes. And then you also have the Afghans who are, you know, have had their homes destroyed, their relatives and loved ones murdered and executed brutally in front of them. Yeah. And uh, and so you have those that are engaged in the war with the Russians already and you have those that are now brought into the conflict because yeah. of the situation. And so you're sympathetic with them as well. And, you know, there's very few movies that will paint the Afghan in a, in a positive light. Yeah. 
Um, and so, you know, that's why I can understand this film being quite controversial as well. Yeah, for, for doing at the so. time, yes. And so, you know, I knew that this was then a chase film. And it was like, I don't know who I want to see win in this situation. Well, that's what I mean. <laughs> you, know, you can't. You, no. You can't pick sides. I, the weird thing is, saying, saying your view on the film. It was like, like you said, it's like a chase movie, but it was also like a monster chase movie. Yes, because the tank, it's called it, the Beast. Yeah, it's a it, monster. It is a monster. You know? You've seen the brutal things that it can do. That's it. If, if you could, I could easily just forget the human element inside controlling the tank, but like I just kept imagining that this monster has come to their village, destroyed them, and run off into the mountains. Now these villagers are going off to, t to kill this monster. Because they never talk about killing the Russians that are in it. They always just say, the beast. It's yeah. always the tank. Kill the tank. The monster. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also just want to bring up that... Um, uh, this film director, I think it's the first film of his that we've we've covered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was the guy who directed Waterworld. Yeah. Well, he's worked with Kevin Costner. He's a worked lot, with Kevin a Costner a lot, actually. And so I was like, and I like a lot of Kevin Costner films. And Waterworld is the one that I always just go, eh, it's yeah, it's, it's bad. Um, but yeah, he did Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Yeah. Uh, which I of course love, especially because we've had another version of Robin Hood come out, which is bad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he also did films like Tristan and His Old. Yeah, uh, which you know, not great. You know, it's it's pretty average. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, I can see the talent in this director, and this is, I would say, I put this one right up there. Well, I, I, I purposely wikied. Uh, I think it's Fandango he did. Yeah. You know, because it said uh, as I was reading on his uh, his list of films that he made, it said you know Fandango was a big film that he made and it did really really well, and I was like, okay, let's have a look, and so I I wikied it, and I'm like, that sounds like a really great movie. You know, and coming off the back of this director, seeing him for the first time, I like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I know Waterworld gets a lot of hate, but visually it's kind of yeah. cool in yes, some places. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm like, yeah, I could watch more stuff from him. The tank is attacked the first time by the rebels and they get scared, the tank crew. They get scared. You know, they, they're always screaming. They're within RPG range, you know? And they try to fire some shots back, and then they've just got to go. Yeah, they've just got to run. And so the well, it's that sequence when the uh, the Afghans are on the ridge above them. Yeah, yeah. And so the tank cannot get elevation to shoot at them, so they need to to move away in order to be able to start shooting back. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's persistent. You know, because the tank is limited on the terrain it can go on. Yeah. And the Afghans, they know their terrain, and so yes. they can use shortcuts in the ridges to get ahead of them or behind them or to launch those surprise attacks. But but it's but it's the couple of the the sneaky tactics that the Russians use, like the the the, 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 the villagers come across that water hole. Yes. And yeah. and the the Russians have already poisoned it. Yeah, they threw a canister in there or yeah, some toxic whatever. Yeah. So it would kill any of the livestock that drank from it and of course it you know and and the the tank crew are watching them drink and they get pissed off that only one of them drank from the water before yeah. they found the canister and so they didn't manage to kill them all. So the tank crew have to get on and keep going, but they know that they're being chased, and so they come up with other means of trying to stop them. So they put a, a shell casing in the ground in the tracks well, with that, a live grenade buried underneath it. Well, it's because that one um, failed to fire, didn't it? It was a misfire, It was yeah. a misfire. So you have the moment where they all jump out of the tank, and they're all waiting in the bushes to see if the, the shell will explode. And the commander says to Samad, he goes, go and take it out. And you can feel the racial tension starting to build then from the commander to Samad because Samad is an officer. He's part of this crew. But because he's from Afghan, he's, he's looked upon harshly by he the is, commander. He is a very interesting character to have in the film because he says that he's been to university. Yeah. And, and his son is, is part of the uh, another work group yeah. as well. And he says that, you know, he... He's unsure now what to believe in terms of the whole paradise dying in a holy war and all of that. You know, yeah. everything he, he's, you know, come to believe has been altered by an education. Yes. And, you know, and that, that but of course, the racial tension from others is, is always going to be there, especially in a well, armed conflict. That's it. I loved, fucking loved the, the conversation he had with Kovachenko. Yeah. You yeah. know, and Kovachenko, Jason Patch's character. It's a pivotal conversation, really. Is another intelligent, kind of school bred character who 
He's the one that we're morally aligned with from the start as well. Yeah, and, and both of them are obviously questioning why they're here. What are they doing? And and Samad is saying to him, like, kind of, he wants he wants to get into the 20th century. He wants Afghanistan to go into the 20th century because they're all still very much in the past. But then, you know, when you see what the 20th century brings along with war and conflict and all these, you know, he starts to question if that's really what he wants yeah but like i said the commander tries to force samad to go and change the showcasing and kovachenko's just like no he can't do it i'll go and do it and the commander's just like well okay fine i'll help you and they take that showcase now and leave it in the ground put the grenade under it and we have one of the villagers come along and touch it <laughs> I was I was very surprised how gory this film was. Yes, yeah, of course. You know this. We've already seen all the attack at the beginning, but I thought, well, that's just that's just a, a battle sequence. You know, you kind of expect that. But you did see the corpse of the guy up from under the tracks yes. as well afterwards. And when you when you see that the guy lift up the shell and it explodes and they come to him and he's missing his arm and half his body, and they're they they know that they can't take him with them. And so they leave him some food and water and he sits up and doesn't say anything, but he kind of gives this idea of, I don't want to fucking die like this. Yeah. And so uh, Mustafa comes back and just bang, shoots him in the head, which I got to admit was pretty funny because I mean, it's 1988 and you know, there's no muzzle flare. Yeah. It's just the sound, but it, I, I could accept that, you know, yeah. I'm like, you know, you, you probably put a lot of money and effort yeah. into the tank stuff. I, I felt that this film almost, it felt documentary-esque in a lot of places, mm -hmm. from the camera work, from the lingo, yeah. that they were shouting at each other, and uh, and then of course I found out that a lot of the lingo and things that they were saying to each other, of course it's American lingo, Yes, yes. Uh, not Soviet or Russian. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and so there is a lot of historical inaccuracies there. Yeah. But it all felt pretty genuine. It felt authentic, despite yeah. not being 100%. Well, they called in one of the greatest fucking film war coordinators you could ever ask for, uh, Commander Dale Dye. Yes. You yeah. know, who who is a... Well, if you don't know who Dale Dye is, go fucking look him up. He's a fucking amazing actor, historian, soldier, all that fucking shit. Oh, yeah. And I, I read up that... Uh, the tanks that they picked up, he had bought from some army officials while they were drinking in a hotel. <laughs> you know, he managed to convince them that they need, you know, to buy these tanks for the show. And I'm like, that's really good. Because that, when you get him involved, it gives the war movie a bit more authentic authenticity. Because you've got somebody in the background who knows their shit yes. and knows how everything works. On that BAR, stand by. I'm a retired captain. Fire! I uh, fought in uh, Southeast Asia and in the Middle East. I believe that there's a certain heart and a certain spirit that's common throughout fighting men. And I think that actors need to be immersed in the rigorous lifestyle, in the horrors that infantrymen and combat people all over the world face. And so to the extent that insurance and lifestyles will allow, I immerse those actors in that lifestyle. I would have preferred maybe the, the main tank crew to have been speaking some Russian. Well, now that's a very interesting casting decision from the filmmakers. Now, obviously it's an American production. Yes. If they'd have cast Russian actors in the roles, they really probably would not have been able to sell or distribute this film at all. No, which no, Which they no, hardly no, did no, anyway. No. Yeah. But I think it's interesting from the filmmaker's perspective to do that. Because as an audience, then you go, they are speaking my language, yes. English. Yeah. I relate with them. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then you realize, wait a minute, they're the bad guys yeah, in yeah. this situation. Yeah. And the ones that are speaking in a foreign language are the oppressed. Yeah. And so... People I should be relating to. Okay, and so that challenges you as an audience member and it kind of plays with your um, uh, your expectations as to what you would expect from a war film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I think it challenges you as a viewer, which is, again, something you don't see very often. So I think it's an interesting thing to do. Well, it was brilliant. I mean, because as the, as the story progressed, the, the tank has escaped again and they're trying to fix some of the damage that they've sustained in the first rebel attack and it's night time. Uh, Kovachenko and, and Samad are having their little conversation and they come under attack again and I thought it was absolutely brilliant that every time the tank was under attack they're in a fucking tank but they are they're in a position that they can't fight back 
like you said, all the guys are in a high elevated position. They're throwing Molotovs. They're, 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 they're blinding the tank. So the tank just literally has to run, run away. And so part of you is like, I should be feeling bad, bad that they have to run away. But I'm like, no, look at what they did at the beginning. Remember what they did. And, the, and it's even more added when they stop in the middle of the desert at nighttime. They set motion sensors all around the tank. And then shit starts kicking off. And so they just unload everything in a 360 degree you know they're they're firing cannon shells flamethrowers machine guns they're killing everything around them and it turns out it's a herd of deer you know but it's that point as well where the commander forces samad to go out and check to see if any is alive and then he he orders kovachenko to kill samad yeah yeah because he believes that samad is a traitor not He's not a traitor. You know, the command is just massively racist. Um, but Kovachenko won't do it. So you start to feel more for Kovachenko. Yes, yeah. Especially because he didn't want to kill the guy at the beginning. Now he's questioning his commands from his superior officer. Yeah, because yeah, he knows his commander is wrong. And so he gets back into... The, Samad gets back into the tank, to relays the information about the herd of deer. And they're off again. When the villagers then come across this area, you've just got that big... Black, black scorched earth right around a circle and i'm like that is fucking awesome and that's they an say awesome you shot. know it's uh, the, the russians they know only to come here and kill yeah that's all they do that's all yeah. they do they stop at a water hole and they're just kind of resting for a few moments before they have to move off again and samad obviously wants to do his prayer but the commander and his just with all this racial tension coming on just says to him nope stop I want to see how deep this river is. And so Samad's just like, what, you want me to just walk out there? Yep, just walk out there, tell me how deep it is. As Samad is walking into the river, telling the commander if it's mud or stone, the commander just fucking unloads the gun, turret gun, into him and kills him. No! For no other reason apart from his own, his own paranoia. Yeah, yeah. And you're just like, what the fuck? You know, Kovachenko now is... He's screaming at him and... Yeah, telling him he's absolutely out of his fucking mind. And it's that argument that they have where the commander's just like, you're going to be taken up on a court-martial for disobeying orders. And Kovachenko's like, you're going to get it as well for killing your own men. And you're just like, it, it's coming to a boil now. You can tell that the other two are conflicted of who to follow yeah do we follow orders we know which are wrong but could keep us alive yes or, because of what just happened to their other tank crew member and so they're scared as well yeah i love the fact that they find out that kaminsky is drinking brake fluid <laughs> and so they're running low and kovachenko's like saying to them he's, he's like look uh we're fucking low on fuel we're low on ammunition we're, uh, we've damaged, we've got damaged tracks and he's been drinking the brake fluid. So we're not really going to make it out of here. And the commander's attitude towards this is, right, I'm relieving you of command and I'm going to tie you to this rock and leave you. Well, they also booby trap him as well by putting oh, a grenade behind his head. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. And you that. know, when the wolves came for him, I was just like, well, shit, like this guy's done. Yeah. But then you look at sort of the way he's laid out and of course he manages to slip the grenade from behind him which rolls down rolls the side down, of him yeah. and blows up the dogs. <laughs> it's like, <Yeah>. damn. <laughs> but then the women turn up and start stoning him and I was yeah, like, that's even worse. So I was fucking... like, Jesus, the grenade would have been better. Yeah, I've said it before, you never piss off a fucking woman. Especially yeah. one with a rock, you know? <laughs> but luckily... Uh, Taj and his group come along and um, Samad had taught certain words to Kovachenko. Certain words that, you know, the, the people of Afghan are kind of honour bound to to uphold. You know, you've got uh, Mil Mastia, which is hospitality. Uh, you've got Badal, which is revenge. And then Nana Watai, which is sanctuary. And it's, it's like the way Samad explains it to Kovachenko, where it's like, you could come into my village and you could kill my family, but if you say this word, I am honor bound to take care of you, even if I really want to kill you. Kill you. Yeah. So luckily Kovachenko is saved by this one word because the, the, the language barrier is so huge between the two of them. 
now that they're conversing, they're they're relying on drawings and hand signals to explain now, to each other exactly what they want to do. Interestingly, a lot of people have said that when this film theatrically first aired or for, was first shown anywhere, yeah. there was no subtitles for this film, Ooh. which I thought might have actually benefited an audience member watching this film to alienate you even more so yeah. from, from the Afghan because... You know, having having the subtitles for what they're they're saying to each other includes you into it, so you feel a little bit safer knowing exactly what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. But if you didn't, and you are in his position and not really understanding it, you'd be scared, you'd be intimidated, you'd be frightened. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't know what's going on. Yeah. But then, of course, the body language and then the, the markings that they do in the sand, you know? Yeah. It's just like that human connection, that overcoming the, the language barrier. I, I love scenes like that. And, yeah. I, I, and this is, again, where I was just like... I'm enjoying this film even more now because now the good guys that are on both sides are on one side. Yes. And, and we're all against the tank now. We're all against the tank. Kaboom. Tank. Yeah. I love that moment in the cave um, where Taj, you know, he's the leader of this group now. You know, he is the Khan and he wants to feed Kovachenko. And so he goes around all of his guys. Oh, such a good sequence. And just takes food off of them. They have to willingly give it to him. And then he gives the food to Kovachenko and is like symbolizing to eat. And as soon as Kovachenko picks up some food, everybody else can now eat. And I'm like, wow, that is... That's civilized. Civilized, <laughs> you know? I mean, like I said, when I was growing up, it was, oh, they live in caves and this and that. They're more civilized than, than people I know halfway down my street. You know, they are they, they they have this code about them that they are willing to help you even though you are the enemy. And they still don't trust you completely. Yeah. But you know, that, that amazing sequence goes right into the next one where they're talking about how we need to fix the RPG. Yes. But the trigger mechanism's broken and so he takes the RPG from them and he's like, Okay, I need another weapon to fix it. Yeah. And you know, and that first, you know, uh, Khan, the Khan just gives him the rifle, and everyone else is like, "No, it's click, armed. click, yes, <laughs> what the f yeah." <laughs> so he's like, "Okay, I'll take the take the bolt out." Blah 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 blah. blah. You know, gives him the rifle, and then he, you know, I think he, I think he took the firing mechanism out to help to the help, trigger to help fix the RPG. Yeah, and I love the fact that Mustafa's like, "Oh, great, now he's broken two weapons." <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then you know, within a matter of seconds, he's like, "There you go, there's the RPG, and it works." Yeah, and it's like. Oh, now the hunt is on. That's it. I, I, can't, I, can't, I couldn't help but laugh every time that Taj was saying to him, like, tank kaput. Yeah, tank, tank kaboom. Tank boom kaput. And, and it, you know, it's like those little words where Kovachenko is now picking them up, like, yes, tank kaput kaboom. 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 Exactly. We cut back to the tank crew who, you know, I... <laughs> Like I said, I was starting to feel bad for them as well because they are now re they are now in a position. They're, they're being chased. There's only three of them. They're low on fuel. They're low on ammo. But we also know as an audience member that they're going to a dead end. Yeah, there is no way out. And that is an amazing sequence where, you know, they're looking and they're like, we can see the road. Oh, yeah. We can see other cars. <laughs> yeah. We've made it. We've made it. And then it's whole stop break. As you just see that canyon, yeah, right in front of them, fucking huge opening, and he kept he pulls out the map and realizes that the burn mark is the, is where the 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 canyon would be, and the commander's just like, fuck, yeah, yeah. But then a helicopter comes flying over, yeah, recognizes them. They fire the flare, helicopter lands, and I'm like, shit, like they they're going to get away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then you remember. The connection that this demented commander has with his tank. Oh, that was a great story he did. He, you know, and that is where you also feel sympathy for mm. the commander of this tank, where he explains to you that he fought in the Second World War when he was eight years old. Yeah. He was used to drop mines or bombs on tanks. Yeah, they would you lower know, him on, on rope. Yeah. To the top of the tanks. To drop wow. the bombs. And you're just like, you know, so this guy was used as a child during the Second World War. And now he's this far into the war. He is clearly suffering from post traumatic stress. Yeah, you know he's he's been in he's been in the shit his entire life. He has he's lost it. And so when the helicopter crew are just like, "We'll fly you out of here. Yeah. We're looking for water, but we'll fly you out of here, and we'll blow up your tank so that the enemy can't get it." And that's when he says, "No, no one touches my tank." And he makes his way back to his tank, and then he calls his crew. 
back into the tank. Yeah. And you know, you you're with the other two, you know. You know, they had an opportunity earlier to kill their commander. Yes. You know, to uh, to to get past this, but now they they got no choice but to follow him and even the helicopter crew are just like the hell is wrong with your commander? Yeah. So, so off you go. Why can't we go home in a fucking helicopter? Because you're tankers. But they go flying off to look for water supplies. And then the tank crew, who have just been told that they're going in the wrong way and have to turn around and go back to the junction that we saw at the beginning, they come across the water hole again and all the helicopter crew are dead. Yeah. Because they've drunk from the poison water. Now, if a commander had just let them get on the helicopter, they would have been able to say, don't drink from that watering hole. But, of course, now they're all dead. And, you know, they're trying to get what few supplies they can yeah. before, you know, our heroes are chasing them away. I love that shot where they are they are just running across the desert with the RPG. And the commander realizes he sees Kovachenko yeah. amongst the rebels. And he's like, we gotta go. We gotta get the fuck out of here. And the guys are like, why? He's still alive. You know, and they just jump into the tank and they just, they just, they just bomb it off. And now it's, now it's just Taj Kovachenko versus this tank because Mustafa has found this helicopter and he's like, well, I got what I wanted. Yeah. Ella provides for us today. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that little joke he says to his mate, like, you're smart, can you fly a helicopter? And his mate's like, I'm sure I can. <laughs> you know? and I'm like, fuck, yeah, you, you know, when you, when you... Spoils of war. Well, that's it, you know, when you've got the time and, and the patience, you can fucking do anything. But we are now watching Taj and, and Kovachenko chase this tank, and Kovachenko's just like, get up. Yeah, because he they see one of their buddies get blown up by a shell. Yeah, yeah. And he's just like, we got to get elevation because they won't be able to aim at us. And you just had that awesome shot of the two actors running across the top of the mountain range while the tanks going along the bottom. And you're like, come on, you got to like, stop them before they get that fucking junction. Come on, we're gonna fucking get they there. Get, they get to that point, and you know, and he's got the RPG, and then Taz just goes running right across <laughs> to the other side, and he's like, no, I need the rocket! Rocket! And this way, he's like, throw me the rocket! I'm like, you're gonna have to throw yeah. a rocket? That is the only bit I really didn't like. Wait, cool, Because it? you see the distance <laughs> that they are from each other, and the fact that he throws it, and you don't actually see him, you know, he jumps up out of frame, grabs it from out of frame, and brings it down, and I was just like, <laughs> Yeah, if that had landed on his nose, it'd doom. <laughs> but he manages to get one shot off and only damages the the, the barrel, the yeah. turret barrel, the which idiot. they're out of ammo for anyway. Yeah, so it was a completely <laughs> wasted shot. You know, the opportunity is gone and the tank is getting away. But it's stopped by some falling rocks. And then I remembered earlier in the film, you'd seen the women come up to uh, the uncle at one point and saying that, they wanted to fight and he said look you've got no weapons and she's holding c4 tied to a grenade and a couple yeah. other grenades and you know in in her eyes you can tell that she doesn't care about her life anymore no she just wants to kill as many of these infidels yeah. as she can but she's used the explosives to use the rocks to fall on top of the tank and now the now, tank is stopped some of the rocks looked a little bit foamy <laughs> well yeah, yeah, yeah i know <laughs> but you know they they did the best that they could, but I was still fine with the effect. Yeah. But even then, the tank is still going. Well. Well, the, the tread comes off. The it's, tread it's, now it's comes off, now. and you, you literally now. watch the death rattle of yeah. that tank. And you're kind of sad for a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I just like the dying the dying whims of a beast, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's you, you realise now that it wasn't really the tank's fault. <laughs> the tank was just being controlled by the crew. By a madman. By a madman. And the crew all get out. And... It, the villagers well, are all they ready don't to all kill get out them. at first, you know. Uh, they're they're, oh, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're screaming suicide. about dying. They're all going to die in this tank. And the commander's just like, everyone, take your grenades. Let's get ready to blow ourselves up. They can't take us and the tank. Well, that's it. What was his explanation? It's like, when you run out of fuel, you become a base. If you run out of something else. And it was just... It was just all these lines of what you could do with the tank, you know. If, yeah. you're, if you're completely out of everything, you turn it into a tomb. Yeah. You know, and you're like... He's going to fucking kill himself and his two buddies there. And they managed to fight him to the point that they put the pin back in his grenade. Yeah, yeah. And give themselves up. And the, the, the villagers are all ready to kill them. And Kovacenko is screaming, you know, sanctuary. Give, me, give them the same sanctuary as you gave me. Because, you know, he understands that if they do what they want to do, they're no better than 
the then, Russians. Yeah. You know, and he's already learned that these people are not like them. They are on a bound. They've, you know, they will bring themselves down so many levels. They'll turn into the commander, you know, just yeah. racism and, and hatred. And so he convinces them to, to let them go. So you have, you have Stephen Baldwin's character kind of just wandering off. Then you have Kaminsky having his boots stolen. And he goes walking off. And then the commander is ready to go. And when he does that whole, it's not Stalingrad, sir, line, you know, how is it we are now the Nazis? I was like, oh, it's so fucking awesome. Yes. Yeah. How is it? How is it that when you have war, there's always one side that will end up becoming the Nazis? In a way, yeah. Yeah. You know, they will just kill for the sake of killing over racism and hatred. And yes, I understand that you've probably seen friends and family members killed in war. But in a way, that is the nature of war. People will die, you know, but you cannot just blame everybody on the other side for it. Right. You know, in a way, in, in the way I see it, you blame the fucking people who, who ordered you to go over there in the first place because they're not telling you the whole details. Right, right. You know? But they, they let everybody go and the commander is walking up to the junction. Yeah, I love that. Where the two of them are going one way. Yeah. And he decides, fuck it, I'm going to go the other way. But then before he gets anywhere, the women find him. And they fucking stone his ass. You don't really see what happens, but it's, I would, I, 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 it's under the same well, mindset. He got stoned to death. Yeah, that's it. Well, I mean, you see the bloody boots. He, he, he buttons up his jacket because he wants to face death like a, like an officer, I suppose. And yeah. he knows the end has come. And she comes back. I can't remember her name, but the, yeah. the, the head female, she comes back with the bloody boots and chucks them on the floor. And she's got blood on her face and she seems happy. Elated, yeah. For what she's done. And I was very surprised that it was Taj who started to give her shit. Yeah. You know, because he'd already honorably gave them freedom. Yeah. And now she's completely ruined it. She's basically, you know, showed the world that they are just fucking you know, ready to stone people to death for no, for no other reason than revenge. And he tries to accept Kovachenko into the group, doesn't he? Right, he gives yeah. him the old rifle. Calls him brother. Yeah, yeah. you know, they, you still got the language barrier, but, you know, they're, they're happy. They're slapping each other on the back. But then the Russian helicopter turns up and Kovachenko knows that he, he can't stay. No. He has to leave so that he can give his side of events because he's already lost his book and he has to explain what happened and they have to pick up the other two guys as well. And so he just he just gets on the helicopter as Taj is screaming at him to kind of stay. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of sad because, you know, they have become kind of best friends yeah. in this scenario. Yeah. Um, which I think is, is great as well. But yeah, watching that final shot, the helicopter flying away and him harnessed in, it's just like, it's still great. It's still a great ending. It was a great ending. So favourite scenes, Ian? Uh, I've only got a few. I mainly loved the conversation pieces in yeah. this. Like I said, the first conversation between Kovachenko and Samad was just awesome. I, you know, like I said, I've never been in war. I have a massive uh, allergic reaction to bullets. When they penetrate my skin, blood comes out. Um, so I've tried to avoid it as much as I can, but I've always understood it that way. That when, Like I said, with Kovachenko and Samad, when they're sat there and they're educated, they know that they don't want to be there anymore. Yeah. You know, it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's just a paycheck for them. But the brutality comes in, and they start getting blood on their hands, and it goes up all, all, all up in the air. I love the final sequence with Jason Patrick speaking to his commander and, and telling him, look, this isn't Stalingrad anymore. You know, and he kind of understands that the commander went through some harsh shit. Yeah. But he cannot take out his hatred for the germans yeah on everybody, on everybody else yeah you know because he doesn't make him any different to what he was fighting to and you know i love the conversation with the commander when he was explaining to him when he was explaining to kovachenko like you know i didn't have time to think my father didn't have time to think my mother didn't have time to think my brother didn't have time to think and it started like you said it started to make you feel sympathy of all the people he's lost everything everyone you yeah. know and, and yeah that's it and and all, all the death and destruction he must have seen at such a young age that completely just broke him before he even got to this age and now he's in command of a fucking giant war machine 
that he's just going to use that as an extension of his own rage. Oh, yeah. My mother didn't think of herself, she gave. My brother didn't think of himself, he gave. I loved all the beautiful shots of the tank in the in in the in the canyon. I just thought the cinematography on that was it's absolutely beautiful, brilliant. Yeah. And my favorite final scene is the conversations in the cave. Just Taj and Kovachenko just trying to explain to each other what they want to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of my favorite sequences as well. Um there's not many favourite scenes, but memorable sequences. And watching the guy go underneath that tank, oh, you know, I, I know we keep I brought it up again, but it, you know, it's going to stick with you like what? way after the film. Well, that's it when they when he pulls the hand out from the yeah. treads. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it flashbacks to it, and uh, I guess my final favourite sequence is when you know the other two tank crew members are in the helicopter and yeah. then they're told to get back in the tank. <laughs> Just their faces, their reactions, their despair that they have to get back in there and go all the way back the way they've just come. Yeah. Like, they barely got this far, and they'll barely get back out the other side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I highly recommend The Beast of War. Uh, it's very engaging war movie. Well, anti-war movie. Yes. Uh, depicting the brutality of the war, the morality, and the choices the soldiers had to make. The message isn't overdone. It may become predictable, yeah. but it never stops being entertaining. The acting performances are all great, the sets, the locations are captured beautifully, and this deserves to be seen uh, by more than the few that probably got to see it on its release. Yeah. It is a forgotten gem. Highly rated and would easily watch it again. I definitely recommend uh, The Beast of War. It's up there with Pl Platoon. Casualties of War, you know, Apocalypse Now, fucking Black Hawk Down, Full Metal Jacket. It's a fucking war movie, you know? Um, like like Gary says, in a way, it's an anti-war movie. But then I'm sat here thinking, how many war movies out there aren't anti-war? Of course, you yeah. Know? How, many, yeah. how many war movies do we sit there and the characters start to question all of the things that they're doing, the brutality that they're, de they're delivering onto innocent civilians, you know? Um it's it's a brilliant movie and I, I think it's one of those films that will actually change my view on Jason Patrick. <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews.